Hi everyone, I'm Father Michael Stala. I am the spiritual director of Hope's Garden. Today I wanna to talk to you about discernment. Um, I'm gonna give you a model that I have kind of crafted together from various different uh, authors. Uh, I don't think of this as being original by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I find it to be very helpful and it, it seems to work for me and the people that I have trained in it. So this level of discernment, we have to start with what is discernment. I believe that God communicates to us, but we're not really good at, first of all, listening, kind of tuning in to God, and we're not really good of tuning out the other distracted background sounds so that I know when it's God talking to me. When I say this, for a lot of people, they think that we're, we're talking about hearing voices, which reminds me when I joined the seminary, they did a psychological evaluation. I think I went through like five of them and it's just part of the process of becoming a priest. And that a psychologist asked me, do you hear voices? And I said, I hear yours. Of course he meant voices in my head. He did not mean voices like other people talking, right? Uh, and by the way, they don't like when you tease. So just to let you know. But I think when we're talking about hearing the voice of God, uh, it, it can be with the audible ears. That, that is possible. It happens in the Bible. It's very rare, but that's the way that God speaks to us. Uh, and that would be very alarming to me. If I heard the voice of God with my ears, I would think I am way off track that God has to scream out from the heavens to get me on track again. And I would be a little bit ashamed that I wasn't listening hard enough prior to that, that he finally had to go, Michael, what are you doing? I'd be like, oh yeah, I haven't been listening. That might've just been in my own way. But I would also be very grateful. I would say, thank you, God, because God wouldn't do that if he didn't want to protect me, if he didn't want to help me to live out my calling. So if he did that, I'd be perfectly fine with it. I'd be very grateful for it. But I also recognize that because of that, I, uh, I don't often hear with my ears. And, and there's a reason for that. Most of the time, it's, it's something deep down within me. It's, it's kind of in my mind, but it seems to come forth from something even deeper than that. It doesn't seem to be coming out of my memories. It doesn't seem to be coming out of my imagination. But I have to make sure about that. So I call it the four voices. Each of these voices are somewhere in my mind. And they're all very, uh, very much a part of the way that I think and process in my daily life. And every now and then uh, an idea pops into my head and I wonder, is that from God? Now a skeptical person would say, well, no, you're just, you're just talking to yourself. To which I say, please don't talk to yourself. Crazy people talk to themselves talk to God. But it's true that sometimes we do talk to ourselves. We kind of rehearse things. Imagine you're about to go into an interview and you imagine what the interviewer is going to be asking and you imagine how you're going to respond to their questions. And we are talking to ourselves. We're imagining a scenario or even kind of talking through the, uh, the day that you have ahead of you and planning. So we do do a little bit of this talking to ourselves. Uh, but uh, you know, so I, I exaggerate when I say, don't talk to yourselves, talk to God. Uh, but what I mean by that is we can fall into a trap. And the trap would be to begin to uh, talk to yourself, think things through in yourself, but make it a bubble that I don't let anyone else be a part of this conversation. So this is ever, ever like prepare to go in and tell somebody how angry you are at them and you're really gonna put them in, your, in their place and you prepare it and you prepare it and you prepare it. And when you get there, it's so much different than you expected. And the person says, let me just start in the beginning and say, hey, I'm sorry I did that to you the other day. And all of a sudden you're like, well, nah, <laughs> I got nothing left. And it's, that's because you were talking to yourself. You weren't talking to the person. You created an imaginary person in your mind that represented that other person but they're not the monster you imagined. They're real people. And that means my imagined scenario was in a bubble that I created, but reality is different. It is much healthier to be in reality 
than in this little bubble that I create in my mind. So you really have to escape that. That's a danger that we do. It's, it's normal, it's common, but it is something we have to be careful about because we can just convince ourselves uh, as uh, Cervantes would say, you know, that the windmills are monsters. So we just have to be uh, careful about that. So in the four voices, when I hear uh, something come into my mind that I wonder, is that you Lord talking to me? It might be a sentence, it might be a word, it might be an image, but I think to myself, is this really coming from you or is it in my imagination? So the first voice would be what I just refer to as ego. And we're kind of like trained to say like ego's bad. Ego's not bad. It, I just mean you. It's just me inside of me. God loves you. God loves your contributions to the conversation. God loves your creative ideas. God loves your imagination. But I am not God, right? And that, that would be a crazy person who thinks every thought that pops into their head is really God. That, yeah, that would be a person who hears voices, right? I mean, that's like, wait a second here, what do you mean? I know that some are just me, my thoughts, my imagination, but sometimes I get a little confused and I think to myself, is this coming from God or am I just hoping that God says this? So imagine for a second that you're about to buy a lottery ticket and you say, oh God, please help me find the right numbers. Seven, 32, 78. And you imagine to yourself that God is giving you these numbers. But you're hoping God gives you numbers. You imagined this. You made it up. One of the ways that I kind of test to see is this coming from me is I think, is it something that I was hoping God would say? Is it something that is in my interest that God would say this? I have to be brutally honest with myself. And sometimes I talk to somebody else about this, a spiritual director or somebody that I have confidence in that uh, will take seriously the discernment process. And they're often able to say, yeah, I don't know. That doesn't quite, that sounds like you were just self-deluded. You're, you're telling yourself these things and hoping that God agrees. Uh, and, and that's perfectly okay. God, God, is, God is not angry with you for having dreams and hopes and even confusing his voice sometimes. Uh, God says, good for you for trying, but try again. <laughs> that's, that's not me. That's you. You're saying that. And so we have to like have a little bit of discernment. Other people can help do that. Reflecting on with honesty about what I really desire. Did I put words into God's mouth? Imagine that this is the case. The second voice I call the projected voice. Projected voice is uh, coming out of my memories. And they're the people in my life that have told me who I ought to be, who they think I should be, what I should aim for, the goals that I have. And sometimes it's their goals that I admire. And I also have these anti-heroes, the people who I don't want to be anything like. But that's a memory in my head. So if somebody compares me to them or a quality that I associate with them, I immediately have a reaction to it. So you might have like your mom said to you when you were a child that you should be a priest. And all of a sudden somebody says to you, you know what? I think you'd be a good priest. That's a calling from God. It popped into my head. But really it was a memory of what mom said to you once upon a time. So having a level of honesty and self-reflection over your life, but your heroes and your anti-heroes will help you to recognize when this is a projected life, uh, voice. Now that doesn't mean that God isn't working through other people. Sometimes God does. God speaks to us in varied ways. And this is one of the ways God speaks to us. So he might be planting some seeds with people in your life, just like you're asked to plant seeds for other people in their life so that a pattern develops and you can finally see, God's been talking to me for a long time, but now I understand. Uh, so that's perfectly capable of happening and, and it takes a lot of reflection and discernment, but it's not necessarily the case. And to have enough humility to say, just because I remember somebody else saying this, two points does not make a pattern. You have to have a series of patterns, a series of points 
lots of different conversations, lots of different perspectives to begin to see some sort of pattern of God's calling and not just say point A, point B, and now I will figure out the rest. So once upon a time, somebody said this, somebody said something similar today. Now I see a projection of what God must be saying. That's, that's too limited of uh, information. Um, so uh, we need more data. So we have to be patient. With our projected voices, we might be picking up little pieces and parts over time, but be patient with that. And also ask somebody to help you to walk through that uh, together and do some good reflection. I like journaling. Sometimes we journal about things happening right now. Sometimes it's nice to journal about things that happened a long time ago, especially those very important parts of your lives. Uh, and, and then we, we, we journal about that. The third voice uh, is the tempter. The tempter's desire is not to seek your love and approval uh, or your commitment and fidelity to him. The tempter simply wants to uh, undermine your relationship with God. He doesn't want you to look to God. He doesn't want you to converse with God. So what the tempter tends to use is fear. But it's not his only tool. He's got a lot in his armory. But that's one of them. He can also use pride. He uses, uh, you know, manipulations that uh, it takes a lot of work on. For the most part, you know your own temptations. So if he's tempting you towards sin, you for the most part know that. There is an aspect in which sometimes he simply wants to disable you, prevent you from continuing forward. So he might put a fear in you that you're not capable of hearing God's will or that no one is capable of hearing God's will or that God is trying to hurt you in some way, or that you could never fulfill what God is asking you to do. So he puts a lot of those kind of restraints on us. So when these thoughts are coming into my head, I have to be very, very careful that uh, I'm not following fear, but I follow faith. So that's my general rule and if I notice these fears creeping in, especially when I talk to my spiritual director, I always mention my fears because he will help me to navigate how do I resist the devil while still being prudent. You know, I, so I met a person who um, made a decision. They were going, we were going across a border to another country. And one of the kids did not have their birth certificate. So they weren't gonna let us cross the border with that person. We'd have to turn around and go all the way back. Now, I wasn't in the car with them. They were in another car. So what she decided to do was let the kid get out of the car, run about a mile that way, and cross the border illegally. He came back with all these stories about gang members that he had met and was grateful that he made it alive. To which I said to the person, that was imprudent. Do not do things like that. You risk too much. And she responded to me, don't you trust God? To which I responded, thou shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It was not fear that would have prevented me from letting him go. It was prudence. So I have to be able to navigate when am I being naive and when am I being prudent as opposed to letting fear rule my life. So, uh, so it, it can get murky. Now, the, the, probably the most dangerous of the uh, discernment problems of the voices is called the angel of light. This refers to, uh, try to think of a deer in headlight. If you were looking at a car directly on and the headlights were on you, you couldn't see the car. You would only see the headlights. And you might think, that's a beautiful thing to look at, like a deer does. A deer stops and freezes, sees nothing else and thinks pretty lights, not realizing the danger the deer is in. And we can be like that with the angel of light. It isn't an angel, it is the tempter, but he has blinded you. He has made it look like something beautiful that you want, that you might even mistake as thinking it's God calling you. Yet, if you were standing anywhere except in front of the headlights, you would see very clearly, that's a car, get out of the way. 
So this is why we always need a community to help us in discernment. At least one other person, where two or more are gathered in my name, so shall I be. This protects us against the angel of light. In my view, this is clearly what God wants. But when I'm with other people, they might say, no, that's not God. I'll give you an example. A 16-year-old falls deeply in love with a 30-year-old and won't listen to absolutely anyone tell her otherwise, and she's going to run away with him and go to California, and that's going to be her life from now on. But she really believes in her heart of heart that this is God's calling. It seems so real, so powerful, more than any experience she's ever had. It seems like God is leading her. But it's an angel of light. It's not God. And everybody else in her life can say, that's a car going to run you down. But she can't see it. She's helpless to see it. That same thing can happen to you. Can happen to any of us. The devil is very powerful. He's not as powerful as God. Compared to God, he's a mosquito. But God has given me community, church, and priests, and spiritual directors, and friends, family. Talk to people and don't make your discernments. God gave me a message and I will do it no matter what anyone else says. That's, that's silly talk. That's a person who doesn't have humility. That's a person who doesn't realize you can be duped. So be careful. Of course, the last of the four voices is the one we are looking for. Using this method, we have now filtered out the three. Is it coming from my imagination, the things I hope and desire? That's my ego. Is it coming from my memories, my projected voices, my heroes and anti-heroes? Is it coming from my fears, the tempter? Or have everybody else said, this is an angel of light, this is the tempter, this is not who you want. So if I could say, okay, it doesn't fall into any of those categories, what is left is, is God's voice. So I will give you an example uh, of the angel of light happening to me, and I would like to give you an example of uh, when I discerned it was God's will. I felt God called me to the missions. I really didn't want to go. So I felt like it was not my ego that was putting this on my heart. Because my ego would be saying, I was looking for any sign that kind of agreed with me, you don't need to go to the missions. And I was getting quite the opposite. I had a lot of people tell me over the years, and on that week in particular, all these people were telling me, you would be a good missionary. We need missionaries. You should be a missionary. So I knew that my projected voice was very powerful and I paid attention to that. Why are all these people saying this? So I said I would pray about it. And when I prayed, even more people came forward, not knowing that I was praying for it. And in fact, many people knew that I didn't want to do it. Then I started to ask myself, why don't you want to go? And it was fear. I was afraid I would fail I was afraid I would get hurt. I was afraid I would be pigeonholed into a certain ministry and not have the options of other kinds of ministries. Fear, 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 fear was all my decisions. So now up to this point, I realized if this is happening, God is working through these people, creating a pattern. And I really think this is God calling me. Then the angel of light kicks in. I come to the conclusion that God if he calls me to the missions, will protect me and no harm will come to me. I never heard that. I made that up. This was now what I wanted to hear. And I must say that it felt like it was God protecting me. I couldn't see it. it wasn't until I got to El Salvador when I started to realize that people on the Cleveland mission team, four church women in particular, had been murdered in 1980. I knew about the stories, but I just never thought it applied to me. And now I realized I'm the missionary. I very well might die. 
And I realized I gave myself courage to get on the plane and follow God's will because I lied to myself and said that God said that no harm will come to me. And he never said it. What I had to come to realize in the middle of that discernment was God said, I make no promises about your safety, but I call you to the missions anyway. And I had to accept that I might die, but I will not say no to the Lord. This was probably the most um, growth I ever had in my spiritual life was that tremendous fear, the delusion to myself, the angel of light deceiving me into thinking it was God, and then coming to the realization that despite all of that, I was still called to the missions, risk it all. I, I was actually quite surprised I survived, um, but I did. And not because God owed me. God didn't owe me anything. God already offered me eternal life. He owes me nothing. Everything else is just gravy. So this discernment process helps us to make good decisions, but it also helps us to understand our right relationship with God. And when it's not God, and I don't, I don't pretend like I've got this, you know, white phone in my room that I can talk to God directly. I know, I know it gets confusing in there, but we help each other to kind of sift through it, take out the background noise and listen to the voice of God. Now, the only thing I, I, I then caution you about is when you hear the voice of God, and I believe he communicates to us, when you know it's him, obey him. At that point, when you know it's him, you can't deny the Lord. Please don't. Because if you deny him, he will deny you. So if you do this discernment process, be prepared to accept his word without fear. 